Hello and welcome to Media Academy Online's Film Diet Podcast. I'm Dana. And I'm Brandon. And for these next few podcasts, we're going to be diving into the world of horrors. So we've been through the slasher films and then the kind of the weird 90s of just like a lull where it was kind of like... They weren't sure which direction to sort of take horror films in, what's going to be, apart from the teen, I guess that was it, basically, was the teen horror movies that were dominating. Yeah. And then we entered the year 2000s and then had Saw and James Wan coming out with his supernatural films and then at the same time or around the same time we had Blumhouse that came out and started doing the same thing about creating horror movies that are... Almost like the extended universe idea. Yeah, it's basically Bumhouse is the the Marvel of horror. Yeah, yeah. Um, where they're basically trying to make a complete world. They might have one or two films that don't exist in that universe, but they want for the most part to sort of feel like they're part of one world, one universe, yeah. and they can share characters where they like. It's yeah. fine. And that's kind of what's sort of where that's going, and that's kind of become the mainstream horror. Yeah. Um, sort of franchise or whatever yeah. you want to call it ip the show um, bets recently there sort of seems to be this new sort of trend encouraging trend where yeah. we can, we're sort of getting these really creative uh, filmmakers filmmakers making some really creative horror films and again that comes down to the low cost versus the high profit. returns yeah. Retur- returns um i guess they can take risks in like we're saying it's a good yeah it's, it's a good uh, starting ground for filmmakers to kind of you know yeah and it kind of it took smaller films to sort of lead the way there and show that it's possible like Mm. maybe one of the first ones It Follows yeah It Follows was a massive massive film for such a small movie and it was a simple simple concept Um, yeah simple but effective and still plays into the teen aspect from the 90s but does it in a more refreshing, creative, and freaky way, I suppose. They played less on the stereotypes that they sort of... The yeah. formulaic stereotypes of the characters they kind of tried to create in the 90s. They kind yeah. of... They branched out from that. <laughs> but they had a new concept as well, where it was supernatural, but it was still grounded in reality enough. It was sort of refreshing. And it was kind of a... Sort of came from nowhere, the film, really. It felt yeah, like it, it came did. from nowhere. Yeah. And the music um, as well, like the music in it, it's spot on, the directing's really good, the acting for the most part's really good, cinematography is always really good in these films, like the lighting, the sound, you know, it's, it's so important and they're really nailing it, Yeah, I reckon. Um, <clears throat> like we've had, It Follows, just one wonderful film, uh, Babadook, you know, is an Aussie one. Yeah, that was. That... It's, you know, for what it is, it's great and it was huge as well, The The Vich or Witch is another yeah. one which is mm-hmm. just the just the filmmaking in it alone is you know is uh inspiring it's and a beautiful film. Yeah, yeah yeah just just that on t- pure technical levels they're just beautiful yeah. films it's, we, we're getting to the stage where they're really f- refining that art of horror filmmaking yeah to where it's more than just creating a formula or characters or just trying to scare us with jump with scares. Just jump yeah, yeah. scares, that's right. It's like Whereas, quiet moment, loud moment, quiet moment, yeah. loud moment, fake scare, jump scare. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but now it, it kind of, it's, they're thinking about it as an art form. And yeah. How do, we, how do we make the cinematography, even, even just like the, the, the colour grading yeah, of the, the film. The colour grading, yeah. The, the, you know, the characters cool. and trying to... Rather than just trying to build up a scary moment whenever they can, it's using those scary moments in the right places at the mm. right time yeah. to actually scare us, not just these fake jump scares where it builds, <laughs> oh, no, it was just someone opening a packet of chips yeah. or someone, yeah. oh, your friend behind you. Yeah. Or, oh, yeah. no. Yeah. You know, just these jump scares that weren't were just there for the sake of it, but they weren't actually building to anything. No. You kind of feel cheated a bit when you've, you've sort of built that tension up and then you don't really get a release for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those films like Witch and all those films, like I think that it's pure filmmaking and then we're getting to stuff like um, Hereditary. Yeah. Um, yeah, to, which is... Yeah, to, to me, Hereditary... It really stood out to me for a few reasons, um, not just the, the the practical filmmaking part of it, but mm. it 
it didn't actually feel a lot of the time it didn't feel like a a horror film it felt like a drama to me yeah and they only used the horror elements in sort of like creative ways when it was necessary for they the didn't, story they didn't try oh we'll put a scary moment in just because we, ha- we haven't had one in half an hour half now. Yeah. and the other thing it does really well is decent character development yeah the characters yeah. all have their own arcs even character sort of that girl in it yeah who gets knocked off pretty quick yeah um in probably one of the most memorable scenes <laughs> yeah I didn't even expect that um she had maybe one of the bigger character arcs, mm. even though she was only in it for a very short amount of time. Mm. Um, for those who don't know, we're talking about the scene where she's sort of hyperventilating or yeah. couldn't breathe. Yeah. Um, and they're sort of... Rust- Allergic reaction. Yeah. Her brother's rushing her off to hospital. Yeah, and, in the car. Yeah. And she's sticking her head out for air, and then suddenly, bam! <laughs> off goes head her head. into a bloody pole. Yeah. <laughs> and it kind of... The thing that stood out there is that, you know... They didn't use the build up and then sort of didn't give us anything. They kind of started a build up and then straight away, bam, mm. they hit us with the big stuff. While we were still waiting for that build up to end, it was kind of straight away. Yeah. Um, and that, that kind of leaves you on edge. Yeah. Like it's not just this thing that's, ah, oh, done. And then you move into the next part of the film. It kind of just continues from mm. there and it doesn't give up. You and, know? and the thing, like, I just remember the, the way they tried to from that point develop the characters in a way that okay I've just killed my sister now I have to face my parents and how the parents react with that yeah. seeing their daughter in the car with no head oh, fuck. that whole I think that was spot on character development in all aspects of it it's amazing like just hearing the mum scream you know you don't even see it just... and, and, and you can see the way she, her acting was brilliant, where yeah. it was kind of a she she did not know how to react in that. It wasn't just mm. a, oh, I got to scream ah yeah you yeah. could it felt like very human yeah it did it felt very <laughs> human yeah it turned and to let yeah. like they added little little quirks in the characters where normally they wouldn't bother, especially for characters that sort of get knocked out pretty quick. Mm. Where you know just little details, yeah, little clicks, the, the clicking, yeah, and the kind of they use that creatively throughout the film as well oh, to sort of yeah. sort of uh, suggest her spirit or whatever mm. it might be, um, which was really clever. Yeah, and the mum with the model houses and how detailed it all was, and using yeah. the camera work to kind of showcase all that and set the scenes and they'd move in and out of the models and then into the real house and mm. yeah, yeah just just beautiful work and it's just like small things like just the fact that that's what she does sort of tells the audience that she's a creative being yeah. and sort of makes you look at a character slightly different to someone that doesn't have that sort of creative outlet in their life yeah like I uh, that really intrigued me that, that character just on that level because it was like oh you don't you don't see that often yeah. At all, where you're just having a character do something as strange as building model houses, you know, and that you, you just don't really get that in That's a lot right. of films. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's not just your generic person at the office doing office stuff. You don't even know what they're doing, but they know, you know they go to an office, yeah. like, oh, mum's going to work today and all this scary shit's going to happen while she's at work and we're stuck at home. Yeah. You know, and it's just like you, you never get into the depths of the characters as much. And I guess an, another sort of finishing up on, on Hereditary, the other thing that stands out is, is the score. Oh, the music. Yeah, the music's insane. It's, it kind of feels like music, but there's something that's kind Sounds of... Sounds like celestial. Yeah. Celestial? A bit jarring. It's a bit... It's got this really... Um, uh, it's almost like, not religious, but like, it's kind of got this strange... Um, it just creates this strange feeling inside of you. Mm. And it's just sort of like... I don't know. It's not obvious music score. And it, it, I could be wrong, but from memory, it, they kind of only used it when needed. And mm. otherwise, I don't remember there much score in there at all. No, it wasn't like it wasn't at the forefront. It was yeah. kind of always just sitting there. And because I guess if you can compare it to something like a Bombhouse film, or oh yeah, it's always the typical. It's always you know, and it's always there. It never ends, and mm. it's always all trying to create that mood. But just this kind of restraint where it says we don't we don't always have to create a mood. Sometimes. Mm. A character is just making a, you know, a model person, yeah. and and that's what it is. Mm. Or maybe a character is just going to school, and that's what it is. Mm. Um, and it's trying to stick to that drama element of it. True. Yeah, and I think that's what these films like Witch or Witch 
Hereditary, and you know, there's there's more in, the, in this in this group of films, but it's those aspects like the composing and all those little things in the film that create this bed or this spine for the film to really really be solid yeah referring to those films it kind of almost feels like the horror element is an undercurrent yeah and it's not always there but every now and then it'll just pop out you know mm. through through a you know a hole in the ground where it's all all of a sudden spurting out and you're kind of taken by surprise in a in a kind of creative refreshing way yeah and it pulls you along you're almost like riding that current throughout the film mm. and it pulls you along the whole time and maybe sometimes you get you get out of that current and it slows down, but yeah. oh, you're always inevitably, you kind inevitably of always, always ready. Coming. You're yeah. always ready to be picked up. That's the art of filmmaking is kind of coming back to Spielberg. This echoes that idea of not showing the shark, not showing the T-Rex, not over-showing them, the creature or the supernatural thing, the demon or whatever it is. You know, the less you show, the less you explain, all those things is what makes things so terrifying. Yeah, you know? and they don't... To me, a horror film doesn't have to shout out, I'm a horror film. It can be multiple genres. It doesn't have to be set. I'm a horror film, so I'm going to scare the hell out of you. Mm. It will scare you, but I think it has it does a better job at scaring you using it at the right times yeah, and totally. developing those characters so you're along for the ride. Rather than just saying we're going to have a whole film and it's just going to be lots of people dying all Non-stop. the time. Non-stop. You get burnt out pretty quickly. Yeah. And it's hard to stay in a tense state for a long period of time. That's right. You know? yeah. And I think the first film for me, I know there's many others, but the first film that really got under my skin, or two films, which reminds me of these recent films, would be um, Exorcist and Alien. Yeah. Just... Just those two films, you know, on an art level or, you know, filmmaking level. Yeah, the drama, the, the characters and the, and I think and the horror it's, element. It's the, it's the restraint. The well. restraint, yeah, yeah, that's it, basically. Um, which I guess it's a common theme we're discussing a lot mm. in this podcast is sort of the restraint of we can show anything, so we're going to show anything rather than it, it's... We can show you, but we're not going to, and that's kind of the, that's scarier than just always showing you Instead of showing you, what don't they show? Yeah, that's, that's right. Kind of what aren't we at. seeing? Yeah, what, yeah. what haven't we seen yet? Yeah, that's it, where it's at. <laughs> yeah. Um, moving on from Hereditary, we can discuss Us. Oh, yeah, Us. Jordan Peele. From uh, Get Out to Us. You know, yeah, that's right. So he did Get Out, which was sort of like a, again, a sort of refreshing kind of take on a horror film to a degree. Um, mm. The, the use of sort of like... Social commentary. Social commentary, I think, especially when it came out, sort of did a lot for that film. Good timing. Yeah, very That's, good timing. I think, yep, yep. Um, but, I mean, it was, it was an interesting film because it kind of was a film where it had a lot of ground in reality. Yeah. That's where it wins, I think. The movie really excels because it mm. has that, such a strong human side to it. Yeah. You know. And it... And it it does use characters in the right way to kind of create the story. Yeah. And then into us, you know, how he sort of took it one step further or, you know, expanded upon that idea and sort of went worldwide or a much larger canvas of social commentary. And yeah. And that, that seems to be his thing, which uh, is, it's good to see them sort of mixing sort of genres and trying Mm. to make more meaning to the film Mm. Um, for us. A lot of people didn't understand it and you really have to sit down and focus to try to understand what that film's about. Totally understandable. Like, it is a... They are pretty... Ob- that, that one in particular is quite obscure. Yeah, no, very much so. From a mainstream thing. Um, for me, the meaning that I got out of it, and I'm sure it is for a lot of people too, but you, you've got the, the good version of yourself, which live in the real world, and then you have the, the badder version of yourself that kind of lived in underneath the ground in sort of abandoned caves or whatever. The tunnels. Tunnels. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I kind of saw that the bad version of is kind of, that's a version within ourselves. We all have the choice whether we want to be that bad version of ourselves or the good version of ourselves, yeah. and it's deciding what we want to be. Yeah. <laughs> the 
the the use of the good versus bad within us was interesting to kind of see and how they kind of played that where sort of the twist at the end, another spoiler alert, um, where the mum mm. sort of had a, you know, when she was young and she saw the bad version of herself and how they kind of swapped places at that point. Yeah. So the bad version was actually living among the good version mm. and and vice versa. It was interesting to sort of play with that idea that it's kind of we're a product of our environment, yeah. which was yeah. an interesting way to look at things. Mm. Where, and it kind of explains like probably the scariest element of that film is just that voice done by that the the mum the yeah. bad version of the mum yeah. was just really Eerie. horrible creepy but in context makes sense because she was able to speak when she was eight she was able to speak normal yeah but then got put into a world where no one speaks mm. so she kind of remembers how to speak but because she's living in a world that's grunting and grumbling, she kind of loses the understanding or the ability to talk as clear as the real us. Yeah. Very well done by the actors, all the actors in that. Probably my favourite part is probably the first 20 minutes of the film. Mm -hmm. That is my most favourite. I I just love how the setup is, you know, the whole beach scene, the filming of that at the carnival. Interaction of the characters. Yeah, yeah, that way that all just plays out. Mm -hmm. And... um, there's a moment when she walks down to the beach and you're just sort of hearing the theme part, the, the, the rides and mm-hmm. and all that. And just the sound design alone in that moment is yeah. like really gripping. And yeah, and and then even the starting, t- the titles at the start with the rabbits. And yeah, it's just yeah that that's right. And long it's ass shot. Very long. Yeah, yeah. I've just, just rabbits. Zooming out and on this. you're thinking, what does this have to do with anything? But it, <laughs> at the end, it makes sense. By the end, you go, oh. That's why there's rabbits there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the whole time I was thinking throughout the film, at moments, I was like, hang on, what's what yeah. going with those rabbits again? <laughs> kind of felt like it would use things where, which are traditionally positive experiences for people, whether it might be the pet rabbit yep. or going on different sideshows or carnival mm-hmm. rides. Mm-hmm. Normally things that we would find very... They go to the beach. Yeah, go to the beach. Something we'd we'd take, you know, enjoyment out of it. But mm. they're, they're turning that on its head as well. The holiday in itself, I mm. suppose. Yeah. Where there is that, the bad side to it, which they're kind of saying something that would normally be really happy and pleasant, that is also being tipped on its head. Yeah, the sinister side. Yeah. It flips. Yeah, yeah. Which, there's a few films that do that, but it was interesting to see how they use that in the kind of social commentary sort of way mm. that it did, in a, in a in a mainstream way, but in a, in a, it's in an, an effective mainstream yeah. way, you know, where they can sort of have these quite in depth subjects, you know, and themes, but they sort of doing it in still in classy ways, but you know, a lot of people walk out of the film going, oh, I don't know what that was about, but. A lot of people yeah. are walking out going, yeah, I, I, I like that because it's making me think. Yeah, well, then that's the thing. When I watched it the first time, I didn't have all the pieces sort of put together. It took me, took me, you know, a good day or two just to think about it and be like, oh, I get, I get it now. Mm. Um, and it's just that idea that it's a film that makes you think. I think we need more of those. Definitely. It, it's good to see that there are filmmakers that don't want it just to be an entertainment experience, but it actually wants to try and um, reflect on the world. Yeah. And sort of leave you with something. Yeah. Something to ponder, something to think about, something to digest. And then when you're living your life, you know, in the coming months, and you see things happening or you're watching TV and you're seeing news reports on something or whatever it is, you're reading the news and then you think, oh, hang on. Yeah, this is interesting because, it, mm. you know, you start peeling back layers in the That's real right. world from yeah. art. You know, art makes you think it should make you be able to um, dissect things in your life, you know, mm. around you and that's the best part about art and yeah, film is a right. great medium for that. Mm. So moving on from Us, that sort of has that sort of social commentary uh, vein throughout it. Yeah. Another film um, which sort of plays on sort of the psyche of people would be Apostle. Yeah, a Netflix film. Yeah, mm. which is, it's good to see Netflix sort of jumping in, sort of trying new things as well. Yeah. Um, Apostle, for those who don't know, it has like a, a cult story within it. Really uh, compelling 
you know, the way they sort of set the story from the beginning. Yeah, you that's know. right. From the character's point of view, they'd be painting it as, oh, we're going to go and live in this sort of haven where mm. everything's perfect and we all sort of have our role to play, but we're all equal. Yeah. Uh, and the characters are saying that, but we knew, we just couldn't, we couldn't believe it. And everything else in the film, even though the characters were saying it, was telling us that that's not right. Stuff wasn't quite right here. Yeah, you got that uneasiness mm. throughout the whole film. Even before the character sort of sails off during his, uh, when he's on the ship and the goat, you know, mm. yeah. this goat just fucking dies and shit like that. And it's just like, it just sets it up pretty nicely. Yeah. What's to come. You know? And the thing that I find really intriguing about these kind of cult films is that it kind of plays on our need to belong, mm. where it can be as simple or as harmless as, um, barracking for the same football team or yep. being part of a, a computer game, you know, playing people on a computer game where it's kind of, you, you feel like you belong as part of a group, but this kind of takes it to a, an extreme where it's, mm. you, you, you want to feel that you belong in such a way where believe or do anything they say. And it kind of takes it to that worst case extreme scenario. But the other thing that it really plays on is that this actually happens yeah where it's it's a reality for the vulnerable people in community can get pulled into the, yeah, these, these circles cults. these mm. cults these religions these pyramid schemes yeah you know coming back to a film plays on that it's again it's got that social commentary that it makes you think about our real life and how people can actually become a part of this in real life yeah and that film has that sort of cult element of it. But it also had that sort of supernatural element. And I kind of feel like they didn't need that yeah. supernatural. It was kind of crowbarred in there just yeah. to kind of, I don't know, make it a bit more appealing to other yeah. people. Which it's fine. Like they kind of used like didn't that. didn't ruin it. No, it, it had that that old lady who was kind of like the spirit of the land or whatever yeah. she might have been where they kind of... Sacrifice. Yeah, they'd stuff. sacrifice. They'd feed her yeah. lard and they'd captured her and all that kind of stuff was there but i did feel like they shoved it in because they wanted to have a supernatural element but i kind of feel that maybe it might have been a stronger film without it yeah the character who was originally like the the right hand man mm. that then sort of wanted to become in charge of the whole uh, village that's what really got me in the film mm -hmm. you, know, you know where you sort of you know, killed his daughter Yeah. after she got pregnant and then used that as an excuse to kill the boyfriend <laughs> yeah. of the girl who was pregnant. That That's the bit that really drew me in straight away and then how all that played about and how the, mm. the original leader got back into it and we kind of saw him from another point of view. Yeah, yeah. And just playing on those character elements, expanding on the characters, the evolution of the characters and the character arcs, That, that that's what I found most compelling about the film yeah i think for a netflix movie that that's one to watch yeah um, it's just it's good um because i mean there's a lot of netflix films that do miss the, the mark yeah misses <laughs> the mark yeah they th it's good that they're willing to give new things a try and they're trying new filmmakers and stuff and that's why you do kind of get those ones that was yeah a bit dodgy but every now and then you get one like stranger things yeah that yeah, yeah. um do resonate yeah stranger things was a really good example of how to do a Netflix show that is nostalgic of the 80s. Yeah. Um, of all those things we're talking about, like E.T., all the things that work mm -hmm. or worked in the past. But it still feels current. Yeah, it has a fresh element or, yeah. you know, a fresh coat of paint. It was kind of like the beginning of the teenagers take on the world of Absolutely, idea. Yeah. We don't really see too much of the adults in it. No. We're usually... Most films is always from the point of view of the adults, or at least share yeah. the attention with the adults. Saying Holds we're gonna, true to yeah. that, the, the kid's perspective. But it's it's also not a kid's show at the same time. Yeah. So it's kind of yeah. an interesting play on that. Even though we're adults watching it, we can still feel like the kid within us yeah, watching uh, that. Yeah, totally. That's exactly where I go to when I watch it. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's just carrying on that that 80s nostalgic thing in a good way. Yeah. I think they've gone a bit too far with it in season two here and there. Um, I thought, yeah, it's a bit too much, but I'm not hating it. I'm not... Yeah. You know, if anything, I'm still praising it. Yeah. But I just think they can kind of pull back a little bit here and there and try and do some more original stuff. Mm. But I still feel like we'll see what season three is like. They might 
address that and with, yeah. you know and get back on track. Well, that's coming soon, so very soon. So we'll, it'll be uh, interesting to see where if that it gets sort better of goes. or worse. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Stranger Things kind of ushered a rival or new kind of storytelling. Mm. Even if we refer to the new it, oh yeah, you can clearly see it was inspired by. It's kind of like the movie of version of Stranger yeah. Things replaced the demigorgon with a clown, and, and you're not too far off. That's pretty much <laughs> it. <laughs> it's still got the the 80s nostalgia. It's still got the the, the teenagers mm -hmm. riding got, on bikes. Yeah, plays on all those cliches, cliches which we don't want to say they're going to get overused, but they're going to get overused. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And hey, look, it's great, good to see kids on bikes again. I'm always up for that. Yeah. And if the movie's solid, doesn't have to be totally original. That's it's right. fine, you know, yeah. as long as they're not every six months or every year. If they're sort of spaced out. Yeah. Well, we're interesting to see how the it too is. Yeah. Which is with the adult counterparts of the totally. new characters. Stranger Things Season 3, It, Chapter 2, uh, Midsummer, Hereditary, that director's new film. These are the things I'm really looking out for. Yeah, that uh, Midsummer looks really interesting, that one. Yeah, and I've heard um, good things. Yeah, watch it, just what, even watching that trailer where it's, again, it plays on everything's beautiful, but mm. it's not. It's that whole cult idea from before yeah. where it's, it's so pi picturesque and mm. perfect that you know it's not. It's... And just that, that, that music... <laughs> The underscore of that music where it, you can just tell that... That's kind of the thing that's like the knife in your mm. in your spine, you know? Yeah. The, the visuals are all, you know, blue sky, sun, a lot of white, like, you know, light, yeah. you know, colours. And yeah, then there's this music that's just kind of jabbing you. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, fuck, this is going to turn bad. But yeah, uh, there's also more yeah. trailers, like news. like Yeah, yeah um, some new, new trailers that have come out. Yeah. Uh, Dark Crystal. Yes. Age of Resistance. Yes. That one looks intriguing. That looks really interesting. Very. Uh, when, I, when I first heard about they were going to redo it, the first thing that I was sort of concerned about was that they were just going to scrap the whole puppetry about it, mm. the puppetry element, and just go all like CG or just try and make it up to date just because they can. Yeah. But it's still, I mean, the environment looks beautiful. It looks yeah. stunning. Yeah. Um, just like... From, from when the trailer starts and you just got that beautiful scenery, mm -hmm. but then it cuts to the characters. The characters, they're the same. Yeah, yeah, the puppets. The yeah. puppets are the same. It's you, awesome. It's still got that Jim Henson feel to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is what makes the, that film and those characters. Like, if you were to do that in CGI, you just totally miss the point. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Which, it, it's, it's kind of... In, it's going to be intriguing to see how they kind of treat the modernizing of something that is a, it is a like a classic puppet animation mm. kind of film but um yeah, it'll be good to see yeah. how they refine that from mm. the original yeah yeah and try and make it for you know develop it for a new audience yeah bring that bring that back into the limelight um another one which is going to be interesting I'd, I'd like to get your reaction of is the new uh terminator dark fate yeah i think it's a leader you know, part two. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of, it kind of just, as soon as I saw the trailer, I was like, oh, damn it. it kind of just reminded me of all the bad Terminator movies mm -hmm. from Terminator 3 to Genesis, you know, and I was just like, oh, shit, here we go again. That just kind of lost or makes Terminator interesting. Yeah. And I think it's, I think they're just showing, showing us too much, um, like, big action set pieces. It's gone on for that big action, big summer blockbuster film. Yeah. You know, which number two was, but I think if they kind of peeled it back again and yeah. sort of approached it like the first film, yeah. you know, I think that would have, that would win over the audience again. They're just trying to make a massive franchise yeah. out of something that shouldn't be. I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but again, the characters are just unrememberable. I didn't get anything from those characters from that trailer. I was it's, like, okay. Even just the, the recent Terminator that came out a Genesis, little while ago. Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> it's um they'd added these new characters, but they were just they were just that. They were just what <laughs> They weren't they, even like you got what's her face from Game of Thrones playing Sarah Connor. Can't remember her name, probably for a reason. <laughs> and you got that other Jai Courtney and oh my god like you compare them to Linda Hamilton and Michael mm -hmm. Bean from the first one it's like 
if you want to see the two difference in acting from mm-hmm. good acting to bad acting, watch those two and you'll see, you yeah. know, how bad these, mm. are, you know, it's like they cram these movies with the effects and the CGI and that's like the forefront of the focus and then they're like, okay, we need some trendy actors that young kids know mm-hmm. or pop culture is aware of, put them in, yeah, but don't push them. You know, don't yeah. make them act. Don't let them become a mm. character. Keep them at that baseline and that's the way they stay. Yeah. Yes, it's like, yeah. And the other thing with this whole sort of revamping of IP that is sort of becoming a trend now, the thing that kind of stands out is that they keep trying to make the world bigger for the sake of making the world bigger and they're trying to expand on stories and add things in which weren't there originally in order to try and make a, a larger canvas canvas i i, I miss those refined storylines that have smaller arcs but tighter but they're tighter and there's, they're not so messy and there's less mm. things going on and when they make like remakes or they you know revamping whatever they want to call it <laughs> yeah they want to refresh a franchise maybe show us something in the same storyline but maybe from a, someone else's point of view. So mm. we don't have to always keep seeing the, like, these same older characters being reused again and again. Yeah. Show it, use it the same sort of world, but just create your new characters mm. and let the old characters be what they were. Yeah, because it's like when you keep dredging back, say, Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, I know he's the main centerpiece for Terminator, but imagine after number two, they went, yeah. no, we're not going to use Arnie anymore. We're going to do something really small. Mm-hmm. Um, no recognizable faces really maybe you know and that would have probably been a better direction it might not have been successful yeah but it would have been it would have lasted the times i reckon and you think about like terminator which is a story that is sort of affects a lot of people in a, in a large kind of universe mm, it's supposed sure, to. you know surely there's other people people <laughs> that we can tell their story in i'm sure it just doesn't fall on Sarah Connor and John Connor, like I know yeah. he's the leader of the resistance and all this bullshit, but yeah, you know, it's time travel, it's different dimensions, you know, if you want to do something fresh, just do something f- different. You yeah. Know? And anyway, yeah. So that trailer was disappointing. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> While we're on the conversation of disappointing trailers, mm-hmm. Rambo. You could just change that title to any typical yeah. action film and, you know... It'll just be an action film. It is. I mean, it's got Rambo's voice. I guess that's probably the the one thing I can say. <laughs> yeah. And if they they didn't even put the Rambo theme in the trailer, no. which was surprising because it's such a famous yeah. theme, and it's just like uh, you it, might as well just call it Action Man in Mexico or something, mm. or Old Man Takes on the Cartel, or you know what I mean. Yeah. It's just like this. There's a lot of these films that sort of get made where. It is kind of like a generic film, mm. film X, but they shove a franchise within it where it kind of doesn't need to. They're saying, here's a generic story, but we're going to put this character as the main character because we can, and so that it we can sell more tickets because and it kind of makes of nostalgia. It, yeah, yeah, nostalgia, and it's all it is. It's just nostalgia-driven. Mm. It's like, okay, it's a recognisable name, Rambo, people know it. We've got about three generations deep now where it's, you know, your dad and then the son and then mm-hmm. now his son that you can take along and go, this is what my dad showed me when I was what, growing up, you know. And so th- this is what they're going for. They're like, okay, how can we maximise our audience, yeah. you know. And unfortunately, there's, a, there's another franchise that I feel is in the pretty much the same boat where they are using the name for the sake of the name but the films are very different that would be fast and furious oh yeah where they should have stopped a long time ago and, and i mean that's fine if you want to make a car film make a car film but just make something different it's gotten way out of hand now, it's just though, like to be stop honest. leeching on these characters <laughs> making fucked. a complete like the films they're making now are completely i don't different. even know what they are yeah that's completely separate to the original. <laughs> They've like turned into G.I. Joe or something. Yeah. And it's like... Cars in the sky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like I, I, I saw the first two. I remember seeing the first one in the cinema and I saw the second one. And then that was it. You had Tokyo Drift. So I think it was pretty much straight to DVD. Mm-hmm. And um, whatever. You know, and after that, I just sort of ignored it. Yeah. 
from then on and then I'm seeing him keep coming back again and back again and bigger and now The Rock and now Jason Statham and now it's like they're trying to turn him into this extended universe idea and now they've got the new Rock and Jason Statham Statham um, offshoot movie mm-hmm. which is those two characters so you haven't even got Vin Diesel in it anymore because yeah. The Rock and Vin Diesel didn't get along so it's just becoming stupid I don't know People yeah, like I, it, but I, I don't. Maybe this is just the the creative in me. Make it a, its own film. Yeah. It's completely different. You just make a new IP, something different. Maybe it won't sell as much. Yeah, no, and this is the problem. This is the current age problem we're in, where it's like they find something that works, and then it's like, okay, how can we knock out 10 of these movies in eight years, or 10 years, I should say, a film a year. Yeah. And this is, they're just, ch- everyone's chasing the Disney dream or the Disney model. Everyone's chasing that, you know? And they've been only successful with one franchise, Marvel. Mm-hmm. Star Wars failed, or is failing, you know, and everyone out, DC's failing with theirs. To I mean, they're having successes, but as a, to, to world, measure yeah, yeah. to the success of Marvel, no one else is There's really matching it. There's a cohesive world that kind of hits all and the marks. Every every you know. film that's come out in the Marvel catalog has yeah. been a success, whereas DC is up and down, up and down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Godzilla's trying to do it. You know, mm-hmm. everything's trying to do it, and it's yeah. just gotten to a point where it's just like, oh. yeah, yeah. Personally, I would like to see new new stories that aren't either an old franchise or a sequel or based on a book. I want to see completely new ideas made, you know, by new filmmakers mm. telling completely new and unique stories. Mm. Uh, and we're kind of so seeing that happen now. Yeah. There seems to be more people willing to try new things, which is good, you know, yep. with the whole streaming services or creating new content now and all yeah. like all of that element we're sort of getting there, but there's still that mainstream the mainstream cinema experience is so watered down and so yep. big now. You know, it's basically the streaming services that are sort of having that space yeah. for that to, you know, for that sort of thing. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's fine because you don't want to be going to the cinema every week. Yeah. So whatever, if Disney wants to do that, go ahead. You know, I'm not going to be there. Yeah. You know, I'll be there three times a year, not 12 like I usually am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. A new trailer, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. This is an interesting one because Tarantino, you know. Mm-hmm. This is ninth film ninth, now. He ninth, said he's going to yeah. stop at 10. I'm pretty sure that's what he said. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, he doesn't want to become one of those directors that Geriatric. kind of, <laughs> that kind of uh, start creating crap films. And, and start lose, repeating themselves yeah, too much. Lose touch on their audience and uh, that kind of thing. I don't want to call names but you'll probably call him anyway Spielberg, Spielberg. <laughs> uh, unfortunately he kind of feels like he's lost touch with the audience and James Cameron, culture and James Cameron. <laughs> well I mean he hasn't been directing anything for 10 years now I so wonder we'll, why <laughs> <laughs> we'll see we'll see what he produces well yeah it all comes down to the, the next Avatar movies yep <laughs> that's it uh, see, see what Avatar has to but yeah Tarantino he's a guy that I love every one of his films yep. I love his work Love his dialogue, you know, well, that's just his quirkiness. Yeah, he he's a he's a film director, but he's also a film writer that understands the importance of script and telling a good story yeah. with the right dialogue. And that's the first thing. Like when I think about the trailer for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it has such a just the thing that got me most excited was what the characters were going to say next. Yeah. Because they're so right wing, mm. and they just work so well. Though mm. he's he creates characters that are so different from one another, but he shoves them in a room and says, "Let's see how these guys interact." And it's really cool to play with that idea. Oh, totally! And he he's, he uses very very recognisable actors, you know, for the most part. Yeah, like this new one, you got Leonardo and Brad Pitt, and see them in a film. And immediately be transported to mm. these characters instead yeah. of seeing them as Brad Pitt, Leonardo, or Samuel Jackson, and John Travolta in Pulp Fiction, or you know whoever whoever it is. Yeah, it's just amazing that he can just from pure dialogue alone yeah. and performance. Yeah, it, that just goes out the window straight away for me, and I'm just like, um, that's right. I'm and believing it, especially with like Leonardo, he's he 
he's a very distinctive actor and you can spot it a mile away but give him the right script and he shines and yep. it's really cool to see like a film like revenant where yeah. he wasn't i think he had himself like three words yeah but it was just like him mm. him his presence and his facial expressions and you know his movement you know yeah. he's still still it's still an awesome performance i love it yeah and that was really good and that's a he's he's one of those guys that give him the right role and it's good because he's picking the right ones now. i think he's yeah i think he's been he's like a, he's almost like getting better and better yeah because like you know you've had from titanic and i mean what's in eating gilbert grape mm -hmm. so he started off really well and then he sort of went to that teen heartthrob yeah, phase which was like Romeo juliet yeah. titanic blah, 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 blah. yeah and that's when i went completely off him mm -hmm. and then i didn't get back into him so i think yeah. i started seeing him in martin scorsese films yeah and then I was just like, shit. Well, that's right. Like, it, it, it kind of felt like he was, he became all the characters he plays. That's yeah. how, how it felt back at that stage mm. where it was just like, well, even, he's him and that's what, he's the same character in every film. Yeah. I mean, even like Catch Me If You Can, mm -hmm. the Spielberg film, that was great. I loved yeah. it. And yeah. that, I think that really just set me on this Leonardo wave. Where, like, the beach was before that. But yeah, you had like The Departed, The Aviator, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, very Shutter good. Island, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, even that was a great one. Yeah, no, all these Leonardo films that came out in the 2000s. Mm. Inception, you know, with Chris Nolan. Yep. You know, and it's just like one after another. He's just, yeah. you know, they were really good. Yeah, so seeing him work again with um, Tarantino. Tarantino is going to be, it's, it's going to be good. Yeah, definitely. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see Brad Pitt in it too. Because mm. yep. I like Brad Pitt. And he was in True Romance, which was written by Tarantino, but... Mm -hmm. He also started in Glorious Bastards with Tarantino. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so I've got that, which is cool. It's good. I guess the last trailer to talk about today would be uh, The Goldfinch. No, no, I'm very much interested and it looks like it's going to be one of those dramas that really mm. gets to you. Yeah. Yeah. It, the thing I liked about it is that it doesn't give too much away in yeah, the trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of, you know, it gives you just hints and they have all these actors that kind of have done stuff in the past, but... They're not so recognisable that you'd, they're mm. stereotyped or mm. anything like that, where they can sort of play different characters. But yeah, no, I think the the lineup's really interesting to sort of see. Totally, um, that yeah. just created intrigue for me. Yeah. You know, and I, I almost don't want to look into it any further. So yeah, I'm sort of just keeping right. that it, like that. Yeah, I kind of wish that that's how. I wish I could do that for all films, yeah. but unfortunately, we have this sort of marketing tidal East. wave whenever yeah. whenever a film comes out where we shoved we pretty much know and, and that's kind of another i kind of like to pretend it's not there but it, unfortunately it is this trend where and it's uh, when i say trend it's kind of been here forever it's got to have been around <laughs> a long time where they pretty much tell you the story before you've seen this film they've told you all the beats in the film they've pretty much told you all these three acts in the film mm -hmm. and you kind of know where it's going. Where it's going. And your brain can pretty much watch a montage of a trailer and understand which part in that film it belongs to and yep. you're kind of piecing it all together. And you've already pretty much made a, broken the puzzle apart in your mind before you see the film. Yeah. And then you're just kind of watching the film, comparing it to that puzzle you've made in your head. That's right. And you're, oh, that's right. Yep. I've hit it. Okay. Yeah. It. And you, you think, oh, that shot's coming up. There it is. And then if they subvert it, you go, oh, okay. Yeah. They subverted it in the trailer for a reason. Oh, that's clever mm. but not just to tell the story better within the the trailer they'll throw in lines or scenes that weren't actually in the real film just to sort of connect the dots a bit better yeah <laughs> just so you do understand 100 percent what's happening Ugh. uh which, exposition mm. <laughs> if we just stuck with just the teaser trailers yeah and great. left it at that yeah but maybe that's just me uh, yeah so, i mean it's a common i think it's a common thing but you get all those people that aren't into film yeah. That they have to try and woo. That's and, right. You know, yeah. and try and go, okay, come on, see this. We'll show you what it's about. So there's no mystery for you. you don't have to worry. This yeah. is what you're getting. You know what you're getting. Don't waste your money. Yeah, don't waste your money. Just come and see this film that mm -hmm. you already know about. Which is safe. It's fair enough. I understand. I don't want people going into something they don't know much about and then walking out saying this is crap. Yeah, which happens anyway. Yeah, it's, so it's kind of <laughs> another one of those beasts of... And again, it plays Appease on... the masses. Yeah, that's right. And it plays on that idea that, that I keep referring to throughout these podcasts where you want the film to do well, mm. but at what point is that enough to sort of 
take away the art of filmmaking. Yeah. Um, and it's it fair enough. It's a numbers game. It's easy for us, you know, creatives to sit here and say that and sound Definitely. like these little film snobs. Yeah. But to me, we, we break down what film's about. It's creating that illusion and creating that world for us all to sort of become a part of mm. and lose ourselves in. And it's all about trying to keep that immersive environment going throughout the film. Yeah. And those characters that we can sort of relate to. And it all comes down to if we if we already know what happens in the film, are we still going to have that same experience? And that's hard to say. It is hard to say. But it's I've, probably going to be different to everyone. Definitely. Anyone who's uh, listening to this podcast, if you've got your own thoughts on that, send us an email and we'll discuss it. Yeah, comment. Cool. So thanks for watching, guys. And uh, we'll see you in the next podcast. Keep watching and adios.